Hello, everyone. My name is Deepak Sharma. I am the director of the AIT Center for Global Challenges. On behalf of AIT, I welcome you all to the inaugural session of the AIT Distinguished Institute Speaker Series, which is also co-organized by my center and the AIT Belt and Road Research Center headed by Dr. Wen Zhu. We are indeed privileged and honored to have as our first distinguished institute speaker today, Mr. Jin Le Chun, the president of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, Mr. Jin will speak on the topic, promoting economic development through multilateralism, a topic which I'm sure you will agree is a topic of utmost significance for our times. Economic development, as we all know, is the holy grail of every modern day nation, every modern day society. Its imperativeness has, if anything, been most emphatically reinforced by our recent and still ongoing experience with the virus pandemic. While our perspectives on the precise definition of economic development, the composition of its ingredients, and the mechanisms for its attainment might differ. But there is a broad consensus on the centrality of infrastructure, of the role of multilateral institutions and multilateralism more broadly in fostering economic development. This is what makes the topic for today's webinar so pertinent for our times. And that is also what makes Mr. Jin Le Chun, a person of unquestionable erudition and authority on the topic, a most qualified speaker to speak on the topic. We are most grateful to him for accepting our invitation to speak at this webinar, and we look forward to listening to his perspectives on the topic. I take this opportunity to express our gratitude also to Bangkok Bank, the main sponsor of today's event. And I thank you all for joining. I now invite Dr. Eden Woon, President of AIT, to introduce Mr. Jen Le Chun, our distinguished speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, the Asian Institute of Technology launches a new series called the Distinguished Institute Speaker Series, which will feature once or twice a year, a globally prominent individual in reputation and responsibility and accomplishment in whatever field that, that they come from. Our first distinguished speaker in this Distinguished Institute Speaker Series is Mr. Jin Li Chun from China. Mr. Jin Li Chun is the inaugural president and chair of the board of directors of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB as a multilateral development bank focused on developing Asia, but with members from all over the world, AIIB's investments in infrastructure and other productive sectors seek to foster sustainable economic development, create wealth, and improve infrastructure connectivity. AIIB began operations in 2016 with 57 founding members. By the end of 2020, AIIB had 103 approved members representing approximately 79% of the global population and 65% of global GDP. Mr. Jin has held a number of key financial posts in China and in multinational organizations. Among these positions are the ranking vice president of the Asian Development Bank, Alternate Executive Director of China at the World Bank, Chairman of China International Capital Corporation, China's first joint venture investment bank, and also Vice Minister of the Ministry of Finance of China. The event today is co-organized by the AIT Center for Global Challenges and the AIT Belt and Road Research Center. And we sincerely thank the main event sponsor today, which is Bangkok Bank. The topic of President Jin's speech today is promoting economic development through multilateralism. Mr. Jin will be glad to take a couple of questions after his speech. 
Please join me to give a warm welcome to President Jing Li Chun of AIIB. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really my great honor uh, to uh, share my thoughts with you with regard to the uh, issues related to economic development and also multilateralism. Uh, as you know, uh, we are really faced uh, with formidable challenges in today's world. Um, the danger uh, facing us is very, very serious and which cannot be resolved without uh, the concerted efforts of the members of international community. So most importantly, as you know, uh, the dual challenge of climate crisis and also COVID-19 pandemic. When the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released its findings, the UN Secretary General called the report a code, code red for humanity. In parallel, the COVID-19 health emergency continues to be challenged despite global vaccination efforts and is likely to last for longer than any of us expected. Now, when I say these are the two major challenges facing the world today, it's climate change, it's, it's, it's COVID-19, I would like to say there's some subtle relationship or co causality. Uh, I do believe that while viruses and bacteria are very hard to be eradicated from this world. They are, they are, they are here oh, in, in, any time. But sometimes we do have to ask us the questions, how, for instance, such kind of deadly virus occur? How this could have happened? In a way, the change of climate, the environmental degradation would be the breeding, breeding ground for bacteria and viruses. When I travel to some of the poor areas in some of these countries, when I saw the deplorable living conditions facing there, I have no difficulty in understanding why bacteria, uh, this, this kind of thing would happen and malaria, dengue, and all these kind of things would happen to us. So even though we humans cannot see or cannot get to the bottom of all of these troubles, there are some subtle links. And that is why I do believe dealing with climate change and uh, controlling the COVID-19 or some other kind of you know, viruses are in a way linked to each other. So all those indiscriminate existential threats do not respect the borders. And that is why we need to work together. And that is why multilateral approach is the best solution. So I, I really thank the Asian Institute of Technology for inviting me today to talk about uh, all these very important issues. And I will be looking forward to the exchange of questions uh, with, uh, and answers with you so that uh, we may, I may be able to respond to some of these uh, interesting questions you may have on your mind. But let me, first of all, uh, talk about the conceptualization of Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB. Um, basically, two issues, the mandate and the governance structure. Uh, back in uh, 2013, Chinese President Xi Jinping raised, uh, proposed in the uh, uh, meeting of the APAC meeting that China would like to initiate uh, a new multilateral development bank, which will be focused on infrastructure development. Um, we got a very positive response, first particularly from ASEAN countries. And I remember I went to Bangkok and proposing the ideas based on President Xi's you know, uh, idea. And there were lots of questions. And I still remember there are lots of people who were eagerly looking forward to the creation of such a new institution. When China's idea went around, 
there were questions, doubts, skepticism. And the first question is why should we have a new multilateral development bank when we do have the World Bank, ADB, African Development Bank, EBRD, and all those regional banks? Is this necessary? Is this a good idea to put money and set up a new institution rather than putting the resources in the existing institutions, which is more cost effective? That's the big question. Secondly, some people were very much skeptical. What China is up to? What kind of political acts they have to grind? Is this going to, going to be a China bank? Is this going to be the instrument for China to, to pursue its global influence? Something like that. Faced with all these questions, I think it would be really very good for us to, to think deeper about what kind of a new multilateral development bank we should create. And if it's a multilateral development bank, we must convince all the prospective members of the necessity of doing something like that and to convince them of the high standard this new bank to be would uphold. So I, I'm very much grateful to the ASEAN countries first, and then we have Gulf countries, South Asian countries, Southeast Asian countries, and ultimately 57 founding members, we come together. The bank's conceptualization was certainly um, very, very, I, I would say, uh, interesting because we decided to create a bank which would have 21st century governance. We should be doing the things as a complement uh, to the multilateral institutions we now have. It's going to be support, coordination, not replacement. And two issues, as I said, governance structure. <clears throat> we, we took a look at the governance structure of the Bretton Woods institutions. Bretton Woods institutions were created before the Second World War was concluded, but the victory of these anti-fascist you know, uh, countries was already a foregone conclusion. European countries, mostly European countries, United States, Canada, China, and so many Asian countries already were convinced that fascism would be defeated. So the big question faced by them is how to reconstruct, restore the economies in the wake of this devastating Second World War. But it's the, while it's the pioneering work, we should understand the Bretton Woods institutions were created seven decades ago. They did wonderful jobs, IMF and World Bank, and all those regional development banks, which were patterned on the Bretton Woods institutions, contributed to poverty reduction, economic development, reconstruction, and social sectors like education, health, Wonderful things, but that does not mean in the 21st century, there should not be a new multilateral development bank, which would do something in a new way, which would do something which may not be possible for the existing institutions to do due to their attention on some other uh, major issues. And uh, while Asian countries, East Asian countries, miracle, China's development indicated the critical importance of infrastructure, which can pave the path for sustained development. We should understand that infrastructure 
investment should be defined in a broader way. And learning from the experience of other MDBs, we understand the mandate should be broad enough for us to cover areas which we may not expect it at the very beginning. That's why the mandate is of this band is to promote broad-based economic and social development through investment in infrastructure and other productive sectors. So we learned this from the other institutions. <clears throat> For instance, EBRD was created in 1990 following the, following the uh, changes in Russia and Eastern European countries. The mandate of EBRD was very straightforward, to finance the transition from the former system to the market economy. And 10, 15 years later, mission completed, job done. So should we shut it down? If not, you have to amend the article's agreement, you have to broaden the mandate. So learning from this, we thought we should leave room for new areas of investment. Who, who knew, who could have predicted that we did so much to deal with COVID-19, right? It's completely in alignment with the mandate, other productive sectors. And I believe health sector is certainly the productive sector. No sick nation could be productive. Only a healthy nation could be really productive and creative. And it's part of the mandate. So when we negotiate about the mandate, some people ask me the question, Mr. Jin, what do you mean by other productive sectors? And I, my answer is very simple. Other productive sectors means other productive sectors. Now, you see, without having to amend our agreement, without lengthy discussions about should we do it or not do it, we rise to the occasion and start to provide support to the countries which are troubled by the COVID-19. And we had no difficulty moving to the financing of their vaccines. So the mandate of this bank is broad enough. And the other issue is corporate governance. The bank is well positioned to remain in the gene pool of the multilateral development banks. This is the multilateral development institution with basically the sovereign governments as the shareholders. It's not a private company. It's a multilateral institution. However, there are some other things we need to look at. In 1944, when the founding fathers of the Bretton Woods institutions gathered in the US, in, in, in Bretton Woods, they were in a different age, different era. So they decided to have the resident board. In New Hampshire, in a, in a, they found themselves in the woods, working together, designing this bank. It looks like this Bretton Woods institutions should not be like a private sector company because the shareholders were the sovereign governments. And then sovereign governments must have the agents to manage it. That, brought forth idea of resident board. And that went on for so many years. Now we are in the age of IT and uh, we have such kind of you know, very, very uh, convenient channels of communication. Should we have a non-resident board just like the private companies? The non-resident board can meet four times a year, plus some virtual meetings as and when necessary. Is this cost-effective? Yes, of course. 
we could save more than 20% of the costs. Direct, I would say direct. And also, because it's non-resident board, uh, we could have a clear, clearer divisional responsibility between the board and the management. And this is really a new departure. I said, we remain in the gene pool of the multilateral development banks, but we are new, we have some new features. That can save a lot of money for the shareholders. So we do not have to go back to the shareholders asking for capital increase again and again and again. This is more cost effective. So I proposed the basic values or principles of this institution, characteristic of a multilateral development bank in the 21st century. The bank should be lean, clean, and green. We should remain cost effective. We should avoid institutional obesity. It should remain lean and clean. Zero tolerance for corruption and green, we're promoting green economy. So that is the, I think the validity, the raison d'etre of having a new development bank in spite of the fact we have the existing institutions. So the governance structure is very much important for us to fit into the 21st century with technology enabled systems for us to run this bank. So we are very much grateful to the founding fathers of the, of the Bretton Woods institutions. And we are grateful to those institutions who work with us ever since we, we, uh, or we launched our business. So I think, first of all, from day one, the management and the staff of this institution think it's important for us to be innovative, to be creative. We should not follow the beaten track. We should blaze the trail and doing something which our pioneers did not do for various reasons. But there are lots of things we need to pick up from the existing institutions. So in my words, we pick up the plus from the existing MDBs, we avoid the minuses because we were created in a very different uh, time. So now I think we need to deal with the backlash against the multilateral approach. Multilateralism helped solve a lot of problems. I think we owe so much to multilateral institutions, to multilateral cooperation. If we look at the peace and the prosperity and fast growth, basically trouble-free over the last seven decades, in spite of the troubles here and there. But overall, the human society enjoyed long peace, a long period of peace and prosperity. Populism, so this backlash, in my view, should not intimidate us, should not scare us. Populism and a backlash should help us to think in what way we can further improve multilateral approach, how we can deal with the unintended consequences, how can we deal with some of the issues which were left unattended through the last decades of growth. Inequality within the country, inequality between the advanced and low-income countries. How do we reconcile the challenges of environment with the need of growth? For instance, when we try to reduce the carbon emissions, GHG, emissions? How can we provide a sufficient electric power to the people and to meet the need for increased mobility? 
over the last decades, we see so many people were lifted out of poverty in China, in many Asian countries, in India. This is great. We humans have never ever achieved such a great success, providing people with decent life. And I think in this regard, the World Bank, ADB, and all these institutions have contributed so much. But the direct result outcome is the increased demand for energy. More people are on the move. More people could enjoy decent life and stay away from the risks posed by the unhealthy living conditions or environment. So in a sense, when we solve the poverty problem, we are creating more problems for us to resolve. And we have to remain firm. And we should tell ourselves that the new problems which crop up can only be resolved by working together, can only be resolved by the multilateral approach. That's why we in AIIB are deeply committed to the notion that the international community needs to be strengthened, not weakened. And we need to reinforce the institutions and the mechanisms that support us in working together, reform and el eliminate those that don't and create new ones that we need. So over the last, I, I would say six years now, we enjoy this strong support from the member countries, from the sister institutions, and from the CSOs and NGOs by working together. You know, we did receive a lot of questions, sometimes very critical comments, critical comments from the NGOs and CSOs. But I think that's very good. And we want to keep open dialogue with them. The world is more complicated than a lot of people could imagine. Give you one example. <clears throat> we have dialogues. I personally have dialogues face-to-face -face with the NGOs and CSOs during each and every, every annual meeting, except the last one because of COVID-19. And this year, I can only talk to them virtually. I remember when I was in Mumbai, uh, having the direct contact and dialogues with the NGO CSOs. One people, one, one group of people raised the question, said, you are financing hydro power plant, power stations. We have serious concerns about the environmental impact, resettlement, caused by the hydropower plants. So we don't like it. And uh, we think you should do some other kind of projects, including, for instance, uh, gas firing projects or some of the renewables. And then after that gentleman raised the question, another group of people stood up, said, we think hydropowers are very, very important. Why don't you support more hydropower stations? Because they are clean and no GHG emissions. And we don't like gas. We don't like coal. We don't like this kind of uh, projects which would uh, create environmental problems and climate change issues. So we are faced with two groups of people, different kinds of views. Both are intended for a better world both intended to solve the problems, but they are not you know, in compliance with each other. So I, I raised this issue just to show that uh, in reality, it's very much complicated. When we do some projects in some developing countries, which I want, do not want to identify, 
We find most of the people are very much supportive of the project, even though it would involve some resettlement. But there might be five families or 10 families which don't, just don't like to, to cooperate. They don't want to move. If you want to make everyone happy, if you want to make everybody agree, this kind of very important project cannot go ahead. But if you do, and then you probably create problems for maybe five or six families. Now, how a multilateral development bank solve these problems? This is a real issue. So we are learning, we are communicating uh, with the G NGO CSOs and trying to convince the people that we need to put the communal interests above the individual interests. That's the things we do. And I can also tell you in my personal communication with some of the people, for instance, green parties, quote unquote, and I met them, they came to see me and they, they told me, you should not finance any gas project because gas projects still create climate problems. I told them we don't do coal, we don't do it. But gas is still important when we transit from the high carbon to low carbon economies. But some of the people are very much opinionated. No, we, sh we think you should stop the gas right away. And then I, I said, okay, uh, let me ask you one question. I hope you can answer my question honestly. When you travel, when you stay in a hotel, how many towers do you use? Let me tell you, I use one small tower during my whole stay. I don't use the, you know, a bus tower, beach tower. I don't, I don't, nev I never put on the pajamas left on in the hotel. And I, I never have one the, the made to change my bed sheets. One tower, do you do it? Nobody answered my question. Because I know a lot of people used all the towers, threw them on the ground. So I said, we need not need to talk about climate change financing or we should practice a new way of life. We should change our behavior. We should do what is possible, at least morally responsible. So please don't talk to me about this kind of thing. Please, when you next travel, use one tower. So I think there are lots of development issues. I do want our bank to do something creative. And from day one, the management and the staff of this institution should behave in a way which is different. While we try to do our best to deal with climate change, to deal with so many issues, environmental, whatever. And to be creative, we have many ways, for instance, COVID-19 forced us to have virtual meetings, to have to do the project by remote work, which is good. Such a kind of this kind of you know, virtual meetings. But does not mean that uh, we should not see each other face to face. We should not talk to each other knee to knee. So in the future, I would say we should have virtual meetings, webinars, we don't have to travel all of the times, but for essential meetings, for the people to see each other, we still need that, right? It's a proper balance. So when we do the financing, it's the same. Now we are forced to work remote and we try to monitor 
the implementation of the projects through IT technology, through AI technology, that can save us lots of resources. But you know, the, you, the World Bank or, or those institutions used to send uh, supervision missions to the field, which is absolutely necessary. But now I think we can reduce the frequency of this kind of missions and using the new technology. So we would like to build in a technology enabled infrastructure. We do it, we do the infrastructure in a new way, which is more environmental friendly and would drastically cut greenhouse gas emissions. So we have a whole new idea to change our behavior, to change our uh, uh, I would, the mind, mindset and to do things differently. And if we fail to do that, the AIB would lose much of its relevance and validity. So in this regard, we will really hope the international community and NGOs, CSOs, other stakeholders try to tell us in what way we can improve, how we can do our work better. So I think through multilateral cooperation, we can do better jobs. If we finance an infrastructure project in a particular country, in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, it looks like it's AIB's team working with the host government. Or maybe we co-finance with the World Bank ADB. We have two parties, three parties, but actually it's not. We involve more people in the whole process. So whatever you may, do. You cannot escape multilateralism. But if you cannot escape multilateralism, why don't you embrace multilateral approach more warmly, sincerely, and proactively? So I think I've taken quite some time. I would like to leave time for you for questions and answers. We are early in the stage of building a new type multilateral development bank. There are lots of things for us to do, lots of things for us to learn from the existing institutions, our peers, institutions from all of you. And we are always open to suggestions, comments, and we are always very much appreciative of the critical comments which can improve our work moving forward. Thank you very much. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Jin. Thank you very much, uh, President Jin, for your uh, informative and very impressive uh, speech. Uh, okay, so before uh, we start our question and uh, answer section, may I uh, suggest or request all of our uh, participants to turn on your camera and let's have a group photo for this um, uh, impressive uh, event. So please, all the participants, turn on your camera and show us your big smile, please. Okay, thank you very much. Our staff already took the uh, photo. Thank you again, uh, uh, President Jin. So um, my name is Wen Chao Xue. Sorry for uh, the late uh, uh, introduction. So my name is Wen Chao Xue, and I'm the director of um, AIT Belt and Road Research Center. And I'm very honored to host this uh, Q&A section. Uh, and uh, actually, we have received uh, uh, many questions from our uh, participants in the chat box and our staff try to list them out. But if our participants, you would like to raise your uh, questions directly through the Zoom, please raise your hand in the, in the uh, Zoom meeting. Okay, then we will uh, call, call you for the, for the question.
Okay, come up with uh, uh, some of uh, our question earlier, uh, uh, collective question uh, by the from the participants. So the first question is about um, um, okay, so uh, about the social sector. So we all know that um, uh, AIIB has uh, embedded uh, invested the, the many uh, infrastructure uh, projects for water, for energy, for transportation. And there is a concern uh, whether AIIB would like to expand the invest in social sectors. So I was quite um, uh, impressive that uh, uh, President Jin has uh, uh, introduced uh, his uh, story about the one towel in the hotel. So we know that climate change is more like uh, uh, related to people's uh, mindset, mindset and also the way they manage their lifestyle. Would you, uh, sh can we uh, hear about your opinion? On, uh, this, uh, on this question? To, to encourage more people to use one tower, you need education. And if you ask me whether AIB would invest in the education uh, as part of social uh, sector, the answer is yes, but not now. Uh, the reason is we want to focus on the mainstream business of this bank, uh, infrastructure. And healthcare is more urgent. So we, we don't want to spread ourselves too thin. We want to focus on the most important things. Education, if we ever do it, should not be the regular education, which the governments are doing. I think what we need in the future is vocational education. This kind of education would be important to supplement a regular education supported by the government. And what is most important is for us to see that the young labor force would pick up skills which can fit them into the 21st century's age of AI, IT. Now, as you know, a lot of jobs would be easily replaced by the robots and things are changing very, very fast. This is not simply uh, a challenge to the low-skilled labor. A lot of the so-called white-collar jobs might be replaced by the robot. How do we deal with that? How should we meet this challenge? I think it's, it's very important for us to keep this in mind now. So it's not ready for us to come up with any kind of strategy which would help us deal with this problem. But in due course, I do believe we will try to tackle the challenge of the new era through education. Thank you very much. I see uh, Mr. Chai Wat from uh, the CEO of uh, Benchat has raising the hand. Please, uh, Mr. Chaiwat, would you like to raise the question? Yeah, from your side directly. Please, you can unmute your speaker and talk directly. Mr. Chaiwat, please unmute your speaker. Yes, right. please. Listen, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, yes. Right, okay. Um, hello, um, uh, Chairman Jin. Um, this is Chaiwat. I'm a CEO of a Bangja Group in Thailand. Um, mm. We are pretty much uh, in the forefront of these energy transitions in Thailand. Uh, we have a, a, a very green subsidiary is producing only what we call green electron, you know, power generated from solar, uh, wind farms and hydros and all that, including geothermals. And mm. we literally set up a, a carbon market club in Thailand and we invite quite a few, you know, uh, top industrial player in the country is, um, you know, uh, enjoy that uh, carbon market that uh, we can trade, can create it. And that probably to me is one way to, you know, reallocate the resources and it's probably, you know, try to get the private sector um, um, to, 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 to help fund and expedite, you know, these uh, energy transitions. Um, uh, we also, you know, invest in those uh, cross-border uh, projects, you know, like a wind farm being built in Laos and then uh, so uh, might be selling to Vietnam, things like that. But um, my question uh, probably not exactly uh, related to Du Pang Chak S Group, 
but uh, it's part of that, that I, I just pick up on, on the last, uh, you know, uh, questions and answer you have is about education. And, um, uh, you know, since AIT is at AIIB, you know, at least we have two first letter, uh, it's the same letters, right? We bought agents. And, um, and uh, was thinking that, you know, how AIT can, you know, work with AIIBs. You know, we bought, you know, probably more or less chat, chat the same goes. AIT is actually, um, as you might know, very famous in, um, you know, those uh, energies, um, energies, water resources, uh, and, and, and the sustainability uh, type of things. And you see how AIT can do with AIIBs, you know, going forward, um, we are pretty much a common goal here. Thank you. Thank you very much, you know. By the title, Asian Institute of Technology, and I think you have technology. Uh, we try to promote infrastructure investment based on technology or technology-enabled infrastructure, infrastructure for tomorrow, and this is our idea. So I will be very interested in working with AIT uh, along with other uh, institutions to see how we can promote the technology development or upgrading in the low income countries. In many cases, countries are, are in a low income area just because the technology is low. So uh, I think this is very much important. And uh, uh, in our efforts to help those member countries is to provide technology and to develop technology enabled infrastructure that can help uh, with each other. So uh, it's very, I think, uh, uh, interesting to know whether AIT would uh, have some concrete ideas how we could work together. And I would be very happy to have our team to work with AIT to promote this wonderful idea. Thank you. Thank you both uh, Mr. Chaiwat and the uh, President Jin for your um, uh, willingness to for the collaboration. I am also looking forward for some uh, future possibility. And we have the next, que uh, next question. Um, the question is um, internationalization and also the multi uh, multilateral trading have made important contribution to the global uh, economy today. However, the impact of COVID-19 has uh, led to a voice of uh, de-globalization. Uh, so how do you see the possible impact of, in, uh, of this COVID-19 and also the de-globalization on the future path uh, of um, uh, multilateralism and also AIIT, AIB? Uh, I think the, with the rolling out of the vaccines, uh, we have already seen uh, the progress made in controlling the pandemic cases. And you can see pretty strong rebound in economies uh, across the world, even though some of the countries are still struggling. So I'm, I think this is uh, a transient uh, incident and it can help us uh, to, to reconsider the way we would better uh, work together. Uh, early uh, in the days after the outbreak of COVID-19, global supply chain was seriously disrupted and leading to serious problems. But it's even through this whole process for the last two years, efforts have been made to uh, fix the problems and to rebuild the supply chain. So once we bring the COVID-19 pandemic under full control, I think the supply chain will be restored and maybe come back even stronger. Now, as I said, uh, globalization uh, met with some backlashes, but those problems can be resolved so that people would have confidence in the, in the effectiveness of globalized economy. Now, in, spite of the, in spite of the outcries against uh, globalization, you know, no, no economy, in my view, can really uh, shut itself from the rest of the world. And they can see more harm would be done to them if they try to uh, retreat from globalized economy. But on the other hand, I think a globalized uh, economy needs uh, the attention of the major um, international uh, 
uh, institutions such uh, or forums such as G20 and uh, APAC or, or some other kind of system to, to look for solutions so that we can achieve growth with equity. We can better uh, help those countries which seems to be left behind in the tough global competition. So those countries who come out very successful are in duty bound to help those who for various reasons uh, seem to uh, trade uh, the other nations. I think there are solutions. We should not be uh, pessimistic, but what we need is to work together. So the problems of globalization can only be dealt with by multilateral approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one more uh, participant raising the hand. Ms. A. Biha, would you like to raise your uh, question directly? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for all you. So let me introduce myself first. Uh, my name is A. Biha. I'm also the AIT alumni and currently uh, working as a managing director of uh, Eco Environmental Services. Uh, which is a EI consultant fan in Myanmar and also vice chairman of the Myanmar Environmental Impact Assess Environment Assessment Association, which is a EIE uh, rotational forming the this group. So my question is after the first uh, February of this year, so our, our country is uh, under uh, military coup. So most of the uh, multilateral and bilateral you know, you know the this uh, financial institution already hold the uh, you know the operation in Myanmar, but AIBST uh, open door for the you know the, the for the financing the some of the project in Myanmar. So, well, my question is uh, how AIB can ensure about the the environmental and social uh, impact uh, by those project in the our country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we did uh, energy projects in Myanmar, and also I visited uh, uh, Myanmar uh, as president of this institution. Um, I, I visited in Myanmar the previous time. Uh, but, but you see, uh, we, uh, as the multilateral institution, is an apolitical institution. We do not get ourselves involved in the domestic political issues. If anything happens in a country, we, what we need to do is to make an assessment of the possibility of continuing or starting the business in that country uh, to make sure that our financing would be a success. So it's purely from the economic and financial considerations that we would process any requests uh, of the Prof, uh, for projects, either from the government or from the private sector. So we do believe that uh, economic development is very important for Myanmar. It's important for the Myanmar people. And uh, we take this very seriously. And uh, I, I think uh, we would uh, uh, try to do our very best to see when we could have new projects uh, in Myanmar. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, let's move on. Uh, we have limited time, but a lot of questions to President Jin. So the next question is, uh, what opportunities are there to form multilateral projects from AIIB to investigate the microbial uh, divers of climate change on the waste, the wastewater and agriculture? Uh, as uh, intensive climate change contributors? This is quite specific and scientific questions. Yeah, uh, I hope uh, uh, President Jin can give some of your um, uh, opinion. Uh, you see, the, as I said, uh, climate change has yeah. impact on many aspects of the economic and social life. So we would, uh, uh, we are committed to do more climate financing as we, in, in our uh, corporate strategy. Uh, we make the very much clear by 2025, we would uh, do at least 50% of financing for climate change. So we would cover more areas uh, 
so far as climate change financing is concerned. So there are a lot of very technical issues, some science and technology, uh, I think a work would be needed in this regard. Uh, we would like to make sure that our financing would be more effective. And for that to happen, it's really very important for our professional team to understand better uh, all those issues. So I can assure you, we, we have to uh, continue to upgrade our skills and technology to do better in the fight against the climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the questions. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, we have uh, the next question. Uh, this is from uh, uh, our uh, participant from the Kasikon Bank in Thailand. So the, the concern is uh, digital infrastructure for business is the very beginning in Thailand. And the platform will link business together from ordering to payment and settlement extending to the lending. This kind of initiative need funding and most important is how to make and uh, scale it. So is uh, AI, AIB also have the concern and uh, in this field, in this area? Digital infrastructure is infrastructure. And we attach importance to the digital uh, technology development upgrading in our member countries, particularly in many low-income countries. So this is an area we definitely can, can uh, uh, consider financing. But there's one point I like to, uh, uh, to, uh, to make. And if you look at China's experience, we have a lot of digital uh, companies promoting um, digital technology and uh, providing uh, a new mode of business just by their own ability to finance. Because you see, digital sector actually is a very lucrative sector. You, you have no difficulty mobilizing resources for that. And if we can help mobilize private sector resources to improve the digital infrastructure in the country, I think it would be great and we'll be very happy to do it. Thank you for the positive uh, uh, response. Uh, and uh, I see we have many distinguished uh, um, guests uh, from our uh, partners and from our alumni. So please uh, take this uh, great chance to talk with uh, uh, President Jin. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. So we have um, one more question, okay, in the chat box to run. So the global pandemic has caused a serious impact to the economy of many countries, including those in Southeast Asia and also South Asia. So what is your view on the uh, potential role of AIIB to support these countries uh, to combat the pandemic, pan, uh, pandemic and also to recover their economy from such impact? You see, right after the outbreak of the COVID-19, we started, we, we created a fund within our bank called Crisis Recovery Facility to help these countries to contain the virus. And, uh, and later on, we moved to finance uh, vaccines. It's not just to deal with the pandemic. It is to help these countries over the pandemic so that they can go back to normal infrastructure investment as soon as possible. If the crisis of this virus pandemic goes on, then it will be very hard for quite a number of these countries to go back to their normal business. And indeed, the building up of the infrastructure pipeline in so many countries has already been affected. That is why I do not think financing for the control containment of the pandemic is uh, not related to our normal business. They are actually very much uh, uh, related to each other. So we have already seen that for those countries which could manage to control the pandemic is already thinking about how to resume the infrastructure investment. So our best way uh, to deal with this issue is to first to try to control the pandemic so that they can resume the mainstream business as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your opinion on the pandemic. 
And also, we have the next question. How will AIIB pursue uh, multilateralism in the world with growing geopolitical tension and the superpower computation? So quite critical questions. Yep. Please, the President Jin. As you see, as I said, the multilateral institutions are apolitical institutions. They should not get involved in the bilateral disputes uh, of what kind of description. Now, yes, I do acknowledge there are geopolitical tensions. There are some problems uh, the countries would have to work out. But multilateral institutions can serve as a very important platform for the members to come together to cooperate on some major you know, uh, investment objectives. You see, uh, we as a multilateral development bank have 103 members working here and here in this institution, in this platform. We can always sit down and talk to each other and focusing on what is really important for the people's livelihood, for the health of the planet, and for the sustained economic development. So I will say multilateral development institutions are not involved in politics, but they can help ease the tension and help bring countries together. Thank you. Thank you very much. So in the interest of time, perhaps we have uh, one last question from the participant. Uh, this question is how does AIIB engage uh, stakeholders, including diverse and uh, vulnerable communities? And uh, to what extent do stakeholder view influence project decision? When we are approached to finance a project, we do a good job of due diligence and have com communications with the people who will be directly affected by the project. So we have the very high standard, we call it environmental or social framework. We make sure the project will bring benefit to the people, not to harm them, not to create the problems for them. And uh, we want to make sure that the infrastructure projects we finance will not leave a big footprint on ecosystems, on environment, on climate change. So the process of communication and a consultation uh, with the potentially affected community is very much important. And we adhere to this basic principle of involving all of the stakeholders for the single purpose of doing a good job of financing each and every project by a very high standard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, President Jin. Uh, sorry, we have uh, really uh, many questions from the participants. So uh, shall we uh, maybe come one more? So this is question um, from our um, partner. Okay, so he, uh, his question is, um, does AIIB process loans like uh, IBRD or ADB? Uh, for example, the preceded by project feasibility study and other project uh, preparation activities. Uh, this is a bonus question. Uh, I, I, I would like to say uh, we have our own procedure of processing a project of due diligence. By, in terms of the standard, economic social standard, we really uh, uh, work by the same level. Otherwise, it's not possible for us to co-finance with the World Bank and ADB or other institutions. But each and every institution have their own specific rules uh, to follow. Uh, and they, they may have different approaches. But all in all, I think we work together as a team. And if we, uh, uh, we, we are approached to finance the project together, uh, I think it's not difficult for us to, to come to uh, conclusions how this kind of thing should be done. But I, I would say, uh, basically, I don't see um, 
a lot of you know uh, differences with regard to the uh, process of feasibility study and due diligence. But what we each of us want to do is to continue to improve the efficiency and to cut the red tape. And this is indeed what we have been aiming at ever since we were uh, we launched our business. So uh, it's always, I think, uh, important for all of these MDBs to think how can we be more cost effective, how we could be more efficient and without uh, shortcutting uh, the necessary procedure. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President, uh, President Jin, uh, for uh, sharing your uh, opinions and views with all of our, uh, our questions. And also, I would like to thank all, uh, all of our participants for uh, your interest and questions. So uh, now we have to uh, um, uh, close our uh, uh, webinar today. So may I invite uh, uh, AIT President uh, Dr. Eden Wynn again to pro uh, provide his closing remarks. Well, thank you, uh, President Jin. Um, I am uh, uh, so happy uh, to uh, hear, uh, as the other participants are, also uh, the very useful and uh, insightful um, uh, comments that you made uh, about AIIB and promoting economic development through multilateralism. Uh, and I'm particularly uh, uh, happy to hear uh, about how AIIB and AIT perhaps have a future uh, together as we have had in our 62 years of history of working uh, uh, very, very closely with uh, many uh, agencies whose mission uh, is uh, development because that is the way, uh, that is why we were founded uh, to uh, help the development of this region. Uh, and also because of our name, because of our legacy, uh, technology is indeed what we try to apply uh, to help the development so that our motto today is social impact with innovation. And we look forward to uh, future collaboration together. Uh, so uh, I think all of you can see that uh, Mr. Jin is certainly a, a most appropriate person to uh, begin our Distinguished Institute Speaker Series. Uh, and we thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jin, for taking your time today to uh, speak to AIT and our friends. Uh, and also I thank all of you participants uh, for joining us uh, uh, today to uh, uh, ask very interesting questions and to listen what uh, Mr. Jin had to say. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, thank, a big thank you to uh, Bangkok Bank uh, for uh, helping us uh, uh, put together this uh, particular um, webinar. Uh, and uh, thank you all, everybody, and uh, uh, good luck to you all, uh, and uh, stay healthy, and uh, thank you very much, and goodbye. Thank you.